Hello everybody and welcome back to my continuation of my book reading of Stephen King's Later. Here we go. My mother spent four hours writing The Secrets of Roanoke with her trusty tape recorder always by her side. I asked her once if writing Mr. Thomas' book was like painting a picture. She thought about it and said it was more like one of those paint by number kits where you just follow the directions and ended up with something that was supposedly suitable for framing. She hired an assistant so she could work on it pretty much full time. She told me on one of our walks home from school, which was about the only fresh air she ever got during the winter of 2009 and 2010, that she couldn't afford to hire an assistant and couldn't afford not to. Bar Barbara Means was fresh out of the English program at Vassar. I was willing to toil in the agency at bargain basement wages with the experience and she was actually pretty good, which was a big help. I liked her big green eyes, which I thought were beautiful. Mom wrote, mom rewrote, mom read the Roanoke books and little else during these months, those months, wanting to emerge herself in Regis Thomas' style. She listened to my voice. She re round and fast forwarded. She filled in the picture. One night, deep into their second bottle of wine, I heard her tell Liz that if she had to write another sentence containing a phrase such as firm trusting breast tipping with rosy nipples, she might lose her mind. She also had her field calls on the, on the trades. I once, from page six of the New York, New York Post about the state of the final Thomas book, because all sorts of rumors were flying around. All this came back to me, and vividly, when Sue Crafton died without writing the final book of her alphabet series of mysteries. Mom said she hated the lying. Oh, but you're so good at it, I remember Liz saying, which earned her one of the cold looks I saw my, from my mom more and more in the final year of their relationship. She liked the Regis editor as well, telling her Regis has instructed her not long before he died that the manuscript of Secret of Secret should be withheld from anyone except mom, of course, until 2010. In order to build reader interest, this said she thought that was a little bit shaky. But mom said it would fly. Fiona never edited him anyway, she said, meaning Fiona Yarbrough, who worked for Doubleday, Mrs. Mr. Thomas' publisher. Her only job was writing Regis a letter after she got each new manuscript, telling him that he'd outdone himself this time. Once the book was finally turned in, mom spent a week pacing and snapping at everyone. I was not included from said snappery, waiting for Fiona to call and say Regis didn't write this book. It doesn't sound a bit like him. I think you wrote it, Yeah. But in the end, it was fine. Either Fiona never guessed or didn't care. Certainly the reviewers never guessed when the book was crashed into production and appeared in the fall of 2010. Publishers Weekly, Thomas saved the best for last. Kirkus Reviews, fans of sweet savage historical fiction will once more be in a bodice ripping clover. Dwight Garner, in the New York Times, trudging flowerless Flavorless prose is typical Thomas, the rough equivalent, equi equivalent of a heaping plate of food from all-you-can-eat buffet 
in the dubious Roadhouse restaurant. Mom didn't care about the reviews. She cared about the huge event advance and the refreshed royalties from the pre previous Roanoke volumes. She bits mightily about only getting 15% when she had written the whole thing, but got a small measure of revenge by dedicating it to herself. Because I deserved it, she said. I'm not sure, Liz said. When you think about it, T, you were just the secretary. Maybe you should have dedicated to Jamie. This earned Liz another of my mom's cold looks. But I thought Liz had something there. Although, when you really thought about it, I was also just the secretary. It was still Mr. Thomas's book, Dead or Not. Now check this out. I told you at least some of the reasons why I like Liz. There were probably a few more. I told you all the reasons I didn't like Liz. And there were probably a few more of those too. What I never considered until later, yep, there's that word again, was a possibility that she didn't like me. Why would I? I was used to being loved, almost blasé about it. I was loved by my mother and my teachers, especially Mrs. Wilcox, my third grade teacher, who hugged me and said she'd miss me on the day school let out. I was loved by my best friend Frankie Ryder and Scott Amber Amberwitz, although of course we didn't talk or even think about that way. And don't forget Lily Reinhardt who once put a big smackaroo on my mount. She also gave me a Hallmark card and before I changed schools. I had a sad looking puppy on the front and inside it said, I'll miss you every day you're away. She signed it with a little heart over the I in her name, also X's and O's. This at least liked me or at least for a while, I'm sure of it. But that began to change after Cobblestone College. That was when she started to see me as a freak of nature. I think, no, I know. That was when, when Liz started to be scared of me. And it's hard to like when you're scared of. Maybe impossible. Although she thought nine was old enough for me to walk home from school by myself, Liz sometimes came for me instead of mom, if Liz was working what she called the swing shift, which started at 4 in the morning and ended at noon. It was a shift detectives tried to avoid, but Liz got it quite a bit. That was another thing that I never wondered about then, but later, there it is again, yeah, 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 right, right, right. I realized that she wasn't exactly liked by her bosses or trusted. It didn't have anything to do with the relationship she had with my mother. When it came to sex, the NYPD was slowly moving into the 21st century. There wasn't the drinking either because she wasn't the only cop who liked to put it away. But certain people who she worked with had begun to suspect that Liz was a dirty cop, and spoiler alert, they were right. I need to tell you about two particular times Liz got me after school. On both occasions, she was in her car. Not the one we took out to Cobblestone Cottage, but the one she called her personal. The first time was in 2011, while she and mom were still a thing. The second was in 2013, a year or so after they stopped being a thing. I get to that, but first things first. I came out of school that day in March with my backpack, slung over with just one shoulder, which was how the cool sixth grade boys did it, and Liz was waiting for me at the curb in her Honda Civic on the yellow part of the curb. As a matter of fact, which was for handicapped people, but she had her little police officer on call sign for that, which you could argue 
should have told me something about her character even in the tender age of 11. I got in trying not to wrinkle my nose at the smell of steel cigarette smoke that not even the little pine tree air freshener hanging from the rearview mirror could hide. But then thanks to the secret of Rurnock, we had our own apartment and didn't have to live in the agency anymore. So I was expecting a ride home, but Liz turned towards downtown instead. Where are we going? I asked. Little field trip, champ, she said. You'll see. The field trip was to Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, final resting place of Duke Ellington, Herman Melville, and Bartholomew Bat Matterson, among others. I know about them because I looked it up and later wrote a report about Woodlaw for school. Liz drove in from Webster Avenue and then just started cruising up and down the lanes. It was nice, but it was also a little scary. Do you know how many people are planted here? She asked, and when I shook my head, 300,000. Less than the population of Tampa, but not by much. I checked it out on Wikipedia. Why are we here? Because it's interesting. But I've got homework. This wasn't a lie, but I only had like a half an hour worth. It was a bright, sunny, sunshiny day, and she seemed normal enough. Just Liz, my mom's friend, but still, this was sort of a freaky field trip. She totally ignored the homework, Gambit. People are being buried here all the time. Look to your left. She pointed and slowed from 25 or so to a bear creep. Where she was pointing, people were standing around the coffin placed over an open grave. Some kind of minister was standing at the head of the grave with an open book in his hand. I knew he wasn't a rabbi because he wasn't wearing a beanie. They stopped the car. Nobody at the service paid any attention. They were absorbed in whatever the minister was saying. You see dead people, she said. I accept that now. Hard not to, after what happened at Thomas' place. Do you see any here? No, I said, more uneasy than ever. Not because of Liz, but because I'd just gotten the news that we were currently surrounded by 300,000 dead bodies. Even though I knew the dead went away after a few days, a week at most, I almost expected to see them standing beside their graves and right on top of them. And maybe converging on us, like in a fucking zombie movie. Are you sure? I looked at the funeral or graveside service or whatever you call it. <clears throat> the minister must have started a prayer because all the mourners had bowed their heads. All except one. That was. He was just standing there and looking unconcernedly up at the sky. That guy in the blue suit, uh, blue suit, I said finally. The one not wearing a tie. He might be dead, but I can't be sure. If there's nothing wrong with them when they die, nothing that shows, they look pretty much like anyone else. I don't see a man without a tie, she said. Well, okay then, he's dead. Do you always come to their burials? Liz asked. How should I know? This is my first graveyard, Liz. I saw Mrs. Burkett at her funeral, but I don't know about the graveyard, because me and mom didn't go to that part. We just went home. But you see them. She was staring at the funeral party like she was in a trance. You could ov go over there and talk to him, the way you talked to Regis Thomas that day. I'm not going over there. I don't like to say I squeak this. Quark this. Quark this? Yeah. But I pretty much did. In front of all his friends? In front of his wife and kids? He can't meet me. Mellow out, champ, she said. I ruffled my hair. I ruffled my hair. I'm just trying to get it straight in my mind. How did he get here, do you think? Because he sure didn't take an Uber. I don't know. I want to go home. Pretty soon, she said, and we continued our cruise of the cemetery, passing tombs 
and monuments and about a billion regular gravestones. He passed three more gravesites, cemeteries, ceremonies, in progress. Too small like the first one, but the star of the show was attending sight unseen. And one humongous one, where about 200 people were gathering on a hillside. And the guy in charge, Beanie Jack, plus a cool looking tall, was using a microphone. Each time Liz asked me if I could see the dead person, and each time I told her I didn't have a clue. You probably wouldn't tell me if you did, she said. I can tell you're in a pissy mood. I'm not in a pissy mood. You are, though. And if you tell T I brought you out here, we'll probably have a fight. I don't suppose you could tell her we went for ice cream, could you? We were almost back to Webster Avenue by then, and I was feeling a little better, telling myself Liz had a right to be curious than anyone would be. Maybe if you if you actually bought me one. Bribery. That's a class B felony. She left. Give me hair. Give my hair a, a ruffle. And we're pretty much all right again. We left the cemetery and I saw a young woman in a black dress sitting on the bench waiting for her bus. A little girl in a white dress and shiny black shoes was sitting beside her. The girl had golden hair and rosy cheeks and a hole in her throat. I waved at her. Liz didn't see me do it. She was waiting for a break in traffic so she could make her turn. I didn't tell her what I saw. That night Liz left after dinner to either go to work or go back to her own place. And I almost told my mother. In the end, I didn't. In the end, I kept the little girl with the golden hair to myself. Later, I would think that the hole in her throat was from the little girl choking on food and they cut into her throat so she could breathe. But it was too late. She was sitting there beside her mother and her mother didn't know. But I knew. I saw. When I waved at her, she waved back. And that is the end of my book reading for today. Thank you so much for listening, guys. I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.